So ultimately, ecological economics creates a platform to inform policymakers. And part of that platform is science-based, and part of that platform is participatory. So what we're trying to create is a science-informed participatory process, if you will. Often in the policy arena, ecological economics becomes a prescription for development instead of growth. So we're focusing on the quality of the economic experience, not just the quantity. Um, too often in economics, we sort of depended on growth to kind of grow our way out of problems. We depended on growth to take care of the distribution problem for us. We don't have to worry about distribution. If the whole pie is growing, who cares about how big everybody's share, shares are? But increasingly in a full world, the policy prescriptions are less about growth and more about development. Let me give you an example. Um, we're currently working on a project in Tanzania that's looking at um, how water scarcity is driving the emergence of new diseases, is driving the emergence of disease outbreaks. So traditionally you would think about water in terms of a, of a resource input, a resource to, to agriculture, a resource to municipalities for drinking water, a resource for hydroelectricity. But increasingly it's not just about water scarcity, water as an input to the economic process, but it's water as a part of the functioning ecological system that, for example, creates processes of disease regulation. In an environment of water scarcity, for example, in Tanzania, increasingly we're finding opportunities for disease to emerge in situations where livestock are using scarce water resources, humans are using scarce water resources, wildlife are using scarce water resources, and lo and behold, something like bovine tuberculosis emerges and jumps from species to species to species, driven by, fundamentally, by water scarcity, driven fundamentally by the decreasing quality of an ecological service or the decreasing um, services in general from a functioning, healthy ecosystem. So the policy advice in ecological economics has come full circle to explore those dynamics of ecological systems, ecological services, and to create the kinds of institutions that will maintain those services over the long run, and to value things that before we never even thought about valuing, such as disease regulation, such as climate regulation, such as other kinds of regulatory uh, processes within healthy functioning ecosystems. What sort of policies could we implement that would help to improve sustainable quality of life and not just um, GDP or conventional economic, uh, economic production? Um, well, I think the, the, the key, a key one is changing our goals, changing our vision. You know, so once we have that goal, then some of these other policies will, will sort of fall into line. Um, and just putting more effort into um, things that do improve uh, social capital. Uh, so <clears throat> addressing the, the income distribution gap, uh, uh, widening gap, uh, what could we do um, about that? Um, so this idea of the Earth Atmospheric Trust, I think is one, and, and trust in general, I think would be one way of addressing um, some of these problems. Recognizing that the uh, common assets, <clears throat> the atmosphere, uh, natural capital, uh, the oceans, all of the, the gifts of nature and the, the gifts of uh, our social interactions that, that nobody had to work to produce. This idea of the trust then um, assigns property rights to those assets, uh, but propertizes them, but without privatizing them. So you're not giving those property rights to private individuals as private goods, because they're not private goods, they're public goods. Um, <clears throat> so we want to uh, assign the property rights to the public, uh, to the community, whatever the, the relevant community is uh, for that asset. Uh, for the atmosphere, it's going to be the global community because the atmosphere is a global asset. Uh, for water and water in watersheds, it's going to be a more local uh, community. That's the population of that of that watershed. Um, and uh, you know, for ocean oceanic resources, marine resources, again, it's going to be a broader uh, a broader community that that uh, that should be the beneficiaries of that that trust. And we can set up trust at multiple different scales. We also need, I think, to take a more precautionary approach in designing our our uh, policy instruments because, in a full world versus an empty world, uh, we can assume that uh, things are more tightly connected that human activities are going to have effects, many of them negative effects, on other parts of the, 
the system. So one policy idea is to have a system of assurance bonds for environmental uh, impacts uh, or activities. Uh, <clears throat> assume the worst, require a bond to be posted to cover those worst case damages, and then re allow that bond to be uh, recovered by the, by the uh, uh, practitioners uh, if and when it can be shown that those damages are, are less than, than uh, the worst case. Okay. Um, fortunately, you know, people hear ecological economics and they think, well, this is pie in the sky, utopian stuff. But actually, um, a lot of the things ecological economists are pushing for are already happening. And there's a lot of policies out there um, being implemented that very much um, correspond to the, the goals of ecological economics and the philosophy of ecological economics. Conventional economists tend to be very harsh about regulations. They refer to them as command and control mechanisms. When the government just steps in and says, you can't do that, or you've got to do this, and uh, those are looked at very unfavorably. Ecological economists, I think, tend to be far more lenient towards those um, and, far, and recognize that the basic idea is that economic instruments are appropriate when there's a lot of flexibility. But increasingly, these days, we're facing situations where we've got to do something, and there is no flexibility, and that's where regulations can be fantastic. Other thing about regulations is they tend to be a bit more fair. Some people are saying, well, we could reduce um, we could reduce uh, emissions by having a gas tax. But if we do that, if you're making you know, $20 million a year, there's no price of gas that's going to keep you from driving wherever you want. So when we use something like a gas tax, it means um, it has a big impact on the poor, where it's a large share of their income, has no impact on the rich, where it's a small share of their income. So we're essentially saying that because you're rich, you get to do is what you want, and because you're poor, um, you're going to suffer from this tax. Um, Another alternative, a regulation, could be like they did in World War II. Just said that, um, you know, here's a coupon. Everybody's entitled to use this much gas. The atmosphere belongs to all of us equally, and you're entitled to use this much of that atmosphere just to spew your waste out. And boom, that's it. Ecological economics starts from the principle that ecologically sustainable scale is first and foremost. Um, that means we're going to put a cap on the amount of CO2 that can be emitted that corresponds to the waste absorption capacity for the atmosphere. Or it could be a cap on the amount of phosphorus going into our lake that is, corresponds to the amount that the lake could readily um, process. Second principle in ecological economics is just distribution. Who is entitled to use that cap? Um, and there's where we could say, well, um, if it's for the atmosphere, it seems to me we're all equally entitled to use the atmosphere. So we would want to distribute those caps equally to everybody. That could be a little complicated. Um, one option you could have is what many Democratic uh, uh, candidates are talking about right now in the United States is to have a cap and auction system where the government sets a cap for a pollutant, auctions off that right, the polluters can pay for the right to use that, and that money then goes into the national coffers and uh, theoretically would be used to provide public goods. We always hear about a cap and trade system, um, which is what Coyote Protocol is trying to establish. Um, and uh, unfortunately, they tend to ignore the distribute part. So right now, under the Coyote Protocol's cap and trade system, Europe has been awarded 35% of the planet's waste absorption capacity for carbon dioxide. We've ignored the distribution part. Within Europe, they took that 35% of the total capacity and they gave it all to the big polluters. Essentially, the more you polluted, the more you were, in, um, more of that you were given. So they really, it was the polluter benefits principle, which um, many of us find a little bit problematic. And uh, so that leads to this dynamic where um, in Europe, the polluters have an awful lot to gain by having an increase in the cap. It's going to save them money, and uh, the average person there doesn't have much to lose because, okay, well, if they pollute more 30 years from now, it'll be a little bit warmer, but, you know, no direct cost to me today, really. If, on the other hand, it had been a cap and auction system or a cap with the permits equally distributed to all Europeans that they could then sell if they wanted, now if you increase the cap, energy has this property that um, it's called inelastic demand. Small decreases in supply lead to huge increases in price. And since you can't burn energy without spewing emissions, the emissions permits would have the same impact. So that means that in Europe, if you had done a cap uh, fairly distribute in trade, um, when the uh, corporations lobbied to have bigger caps, then people say, wait a minute, that's going to be more pollution for me and less income. 
So if there's more caps, the total number of caps times the price of the cap will actually go down. So you would have a built-in mechanism if you had a fair distribution to really have political pressure to tighten the caps instead of relaxing them.